Today I'm going to do a really interesting video, second video about a peer-reviewed study that showed that indeed the Pfizer mRNA vaccines have been contaminated with the bacterioplasmid DNA, but there's some good news in it as well. But what's really interesting about this paper is that it was published by high school students. I find this very ironic because it seems like science wants to ignore this and it looks like we need kids to teach us a lesson. Very, very interesting. And to make it even funnier, the laboratories that these kids did these serious experiments that show us very important information were done in the FDA laboratories. So uh, I almost thought that perhaps would what was happening here is that some of the FDA scientists were being rebellious and trying to, to tell the world, look, we actually do want to find this information. Maybe it's like a taboo topic. So we're going to basically bring up this notion in an embarrassing manner to make sure, hey, uh, you know, like we need to get this done. And they let, uh, some senior scientists were guiding these, these kids to publish this information. Now, this information was published in a journal of high school studies, something like that, or Journal of High School Science. So it's legitimate, it's genuinely peer reviewed. And, and uh, they did two things. Actually, first of all, my name is Dr. Michael Rashik of Merogenomics. And uh, now let me give you the details. They did two things. They obviously looked for how much of that bacterioplasmid DNA was being contaminated in these vaccines, number one. And number two, they did something really, really interesting they decided to take the bacterial information bacterial plasmid and see if they can put it back together now why is this because in the very first figure of the paper they show us a very cool figure where they where they show what 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 happened in the process of making vaccines so these bacterial plasmid dna plasmid means the dna itself is a circular dna it was cut so then it becomes linear and then R, then RNA polymerase, which is like a little biological machinery, used the DNA as a template to produce mRNA. And then that mRNA was the DNA itself, that template, the bacterial template DNA, was all cut up to tiny, tiny pieces. And this was the assumption that this is good enough. This is good enough. And then the mRNA, of course, is packaged inside what is referred to as lipid nanoparticles. So these tiny little bubbles of fat, if you will, and that became the vaccine. So that's the first figure here. Now, there's we already did a bunch of videos on, on this topic. This was basically brought forth to our collective knowledge maybe about a year and a half ago by some preprints that still have not been peer reviewed and published where the alarm was was made that hey these contaminations could be dangerous because these fragments if they get inside dna fragments if they get inside our cells there is a risk potentially that they could be for example in getting inserted in our genomes right it's just dangerous potentially and on top of that these plasmids that pfizer used had a promoter for a specific from a specific virus called SV40, and that those elements are known to guide DNA into the nucleus where our genomes are housed, and this is the additional concern. Okay, so what these kids wanted to do is they wanted to see have are there any sizes fragments inside these vaccines that could still be acting like that original plasmid? Are they all big enough or intact enough that they could cause a problem? And the reason they could test for that is because that bacterial plasmid had an antibiotic resistance gene, which basically allows the bacteria to survive in an environment where antibiotic is added. This is how you select for the bacteria with the plasmid you want. So what they did is they added, again, a different molecular machinery that allowed them to check to put back this linear DNA into the circle. They then, once they isolated the DNA, they put it in the bacteria and they wanted to see, are any of these bacteria become resistant to antibiotic? Now, they, what they did is they took two lots of Pfizer vaccines. One was monovalent, meaning it was protecting you for one of the variants and the other one uh, of SARS-CoV-2 and the other one was bivalent, which means it protected you against two different variants. And then what they did is, uh, and they used a bunch of these vials. I believe these were brand new, unopened, so legitimate work. And the good news is that when they tried to do this 
they did not manage to make any bacteria antibiotic resistant, meaning that there was, according to them, the DNA, the bacterial DNA was cut up enough that it could never be made back again into whole plasmid. And that's a good news because that would suggest that these elements of concern, such as that SV40 promoter, is likely, unlikely to be cancer-causing or anything like that. Now, obviously, some argue against that is that any DNA fragment inside our cells could be a problem, but at least that's basically how they were, they were summarizing it. But they did, of course, they also checked the sizes of these fragments. They said they were all very tiny, very, very tiny. So, so it seems like at least one thing that the Pfizer did correctly is they did seem to cut up that contaminating bacterial DNA fragments into small enough fragments that it shouldn't be a concern. So obviously that's, that's, uh, that's good news. Now, what else they did is they, of course, measured the amount of DNA and this is that was still being contaminate, contaminating these, these uh, vaccines. And uh, that's another interesting element. Basically, they use two different methods to measure DNA. One of them is more precise than the other. One of them was was basically looking at any type of genetic material, whether it's single-stranded or double-stranded, whether it's RNA or DNA. And uh, with that measurement, they measured a lot, about more than 4,000 nanograms of genetic material that was um, inside these vaccines. Now, the allowed contaminated material, according to World Health Organization, is, should be less than 10 nanograms of naked DNA. Now, that naked means it's not delivered to the cell in any um, lipid nanoparticle. So we don't actually know what the allowable amount is inside a lipid nanoparticle. There's actually no science on that. We simply don't know and we still are yet to find that out. But so that, was, that measurement was very, very high, at least 400 more above the allowable amount. They use another method that is more precise for measuring double-stranded DNA. And that one was uh, on, on average about six times higher than allowable amount. The average amounts they were observing in these different vaccines was between 40 to 110 nanograms. So, but on average about six times higher above that allowable threshold, which is not even for, for different types of contamination. Again, this is supposed to be naked DNA. Naked DNA does not get inside our cells versus inside these vaccines, the DNA actually ends up being delivered inside the, inside the cells. So they show that graph uh, where where they measure these amounts so very interesting that we need high school kids to finally deliver us proper science that scientists don't seem to be wanting to to do they do mention that these are concerns that need to be investigated obviously some people are worried that uh, that this could be a problem and these kids remind us you know what what we should be doing is we should be measuring these vaccines uh, in a much gr um, greater quantity to really determine what is going on and we should figure out what is that allowable amount that is safe so that people stop worrying about uh, vaccines and they mention, look, this could lead to a problem where people will become anti-vaccine because of these constant persistent worries that we're finding out. Why? Because of how rapidly these vaccines were developed. They didn't take 10 years to be built. They took only a few months. All right, so this is very quick and fun and easy paper three that I do recommend check it out. I didn't even know that high school students publish like that. I think that's amazing that, that they get to do this. It's super cool. Uh, and right on for this kid to do this and bring us this knowledge. And uh, before I go, I just wanted to let you know, I have a Patreon account where now all the videos before, do, before they end up on YouTube, they are pre-screened on Patreon uh, account. Some of them are free, most of them are not at, th at that point. All of the videos that talk about self-help are always free, but then the Patreon members also now get to vote which videos do end up going uh, being published on YouTube. So if you want to participate in that, become a patron member as well. And of course, on top of that, uh, so now more and more of the content that we publish is related to what patrons actually suggest that I should be studying and making videos on. All right, I look forward to, guys, to seeing you guys in another installment. See you a little bit higher up on the trail. Ciao.